Matthew. How are you this morning? I'm doing really well. How are you today? Good. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, happy, uh, Easter. happy Easter to you too. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Make co-host. Okay. I think I just made you a co-host. Ooh, I get to manage participants and security now. Nice. You want me to turn on the recording? I can handle that as well. I, the recording has already begun. It's happening here. You could record it on your end too, probably, if that would be easier for you, but I have it going here. Okay. Um, in terms of uploading it after without having to pass a, you know, 30 meg file, I might go ahead and record it. Sounds wise. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah, you know, we had issues with that yesterday with Steve and I trying to pass some video files back and forth from Pastor Sermon and stuff. And it was, yeah. Um, yeah. I ended up just doing what minor editing I could do on my side and uploading it from there. So. <laughs> So I'll go ahead and record here just so I have it, the file on my side. Perfect. All right, I'm going to mute it for Hello, Kiefer's. How are you today?
Good morning, Tracy. Good morning, Jeff. Ben, do you recognize the 396 number? I don't. That was about the. I'll go, I'll go check the directory. Oh, that's what I was going to. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, morning. Good morning. Oh, that's, uh, I hear Tracy hey, Martini. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Oh, there's Steve Morris. Steve, I think one of your kids is upside down. <laughs> there's Sayla. What's up? Oh, chat message. From the Kiefers. Good morning to all. Good morning, Kiefers. Good, uh, good to have you here. Hey, can someone tell me when I... I'm about to press the share screen button. Can someone tell me what screen on my computer I end up sharing? Can you guys hear us? I had just heard someone. Was that Steve? That's me. We're going to go ahead and go back on mute, but I just want to make sure everyone can hear us. Good morning, Ben. Good to see you. To see and you. everyone else. Uh, happy. I see Paul's letter to Philemon. Ah, okay. Thank you. Oh, you know what, Matthew? It looks like Doug Kiefer's cell phone ends in 396. I'm going to go ahead and admit that number to the meeting. I think they dropped off, so they might have to call back in. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, I'll text them. Paul oh, Isaac. Hey. Oh, Joan Matthews. Look at all these cool people. Hey, uh, good morning, Aunt Kathy, everyone else. Kathleen Switzer is my aunt. I invited her along today. Oh, awesome. Well, wonderful to have you, Kathy. I recognize the name from Facebook. Facebook's good for something.
Well, it's not even start time yet, and I've already drunk half my water, so I'm going to step away to refill. Hey, Ben, uh, the keepers did make it in. They're just uh, online, but they don't have their video camera, uh, but they can hear and see us. Oh, good, good. Go ahead, step away. I'll man the admissions. But I don't have a picture now. See, I have. Oh, wow. Multiple pictures, and it will be just a slight or more different pictures you'll see. I have a big Donna speaking here. I don't know what that means. Do I swipe some more? No. <clears throat> Got more people showing up. Good to see everybody. Hey, it's and, uh, Hello. And here's Hi. Joe Brooks. He's related to me. That's my dad. Welcome, Welcome to dad. Hi, dad. <laughs> Janelle, can you hear us? We can see you just fine. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. I hear Happy Easter. Easter. Good to see all your faces. You too. Hello, Janelle. Oh, here comes mom. <laughs> Let's see, we can. Here's Denise Brooks. Hi, mom. Elise Freemark wants in. I guess I'll let her in. Out. Well, you're still talking, so I don't know. Hey, fun, uh, fun hint if you've never used Zoom before. In the upper right corner of the black panel where all the faces are, there should be a button that says either speaker view or gallery view. I think that's only if you downloaded the client to your computer. If you joined by browser, you probably don't have the option, but if you downloaded the client, you can switch between speaker view in gallery view. And if you choose gallery view, then uh, you get to see everybody else's bright, shiny face. To see all the lovely people. Well, this is just not working. I don't know how to make it work. Well, maybe I can get it on, on the iPad. Oh, Shashi's here. All right, 10.02 a.m., we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you all could make it. This is going to be uh, 
Resurrection Day Sunday School, we're going to talk about Philemon. Uh, since it's a uh, Zoom meeting and we've never done this before, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. Nothing personal. And if I did it correctly, you won't be able to unmute yourself. So now I, <laughs> no one can hear you say anything. Sorry. But that's okay, because I have lots of things to say. So it's going to be great. Let's begin with, uh, oh, Ruby Isaac wants in. Yeah, we'll, we'll let her come in. Okay. Let's begin with uh, a prayer to our Heavenly Father. So, uh, Father in Heaven, I thank you that you have loved us from before the beginning of the world, from before the foundation of the earth. I thank you that you have, at the, the appropriate moment in history, you have sent your Son to die on a cross under the weight of our sin and your wrath against our sin so that we will never have to. You have raised him to life again and made him the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and you welcome us in him as though we were Christ. I thank you for all the riches of Christ that you have given to us, and I pray that as we look at your word today, you would enable us to understand better who Christ is and what we have in him, and so to rest more in him. I thank you in Christ's name and by his spirit. Amen. Today we're looking at uh, Paul's letter to Philemon. I'm going to start screen sharing. So I guess let me know. I don't know how you'll let me know because you're all muted. But uh, maybe just send me a text message if you fail to see what comes up on the screen here. I'm or, share. Or, or use the chat. Oh, yeah, chat. Chat's a great idea. I'll through the chat. Perfect. I'm going to share... There it is. Starting now, you should all see Paul's letter to Philemon. And I'll make it bigger, just a moment. There we go. Paul's letter to Philemon, probably written between the years 61 and 63 during Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. And probably also at the same time as the letter to the Colossian church, because Philemon was a member of the Colossian church. He lived in Colossae. Uh, you can see Onesimus mentioned in chapter four of the book of Colossians. And those two letters were probably delivered at the same time by the same person, Tychicus, with Onesimus going along with them. The occasion for writing was that the slave Onesimus, he has fled from his master Philemon, who is a Christian in Colossae, Arriving in Rome, Onesimus encounters Paul, and he is converted under the preaching of Paul. He becomes a Christian, as Paul and Philemon are. Paul now sends Onesimus back to Colossae to be reconciled to Philemon, because they are Christian brothers. And this is, uh, this is a big deal. There's a lot on the line here. Onesimus is still legally a slave of Philemon. Philemon has the right to inflict corporal punishment. He could flog Philemon. He could kill Philemon. This is a big deal. And therefore, Paul's purpose in writing the letter is to persuade Philemon to forgive Onesimus. And not just to forgive Onesimus, but to forgive him with the same forgiveness that Philemon has received from Christ, according to what Philemon would have read in the letter to the Colossians that he just received at the same time. Chapter 3, verse 13. As Christ has forgiven you, so you must forgive one another and also to accept Onesimus in love, as is appropriate between Christian brothers. That was Paul's purpose in writing then. What's its utility now? What do we get out of the letter to Philemon today? Well, it is a, it's a case study in the, the walk worthy of the gospel, in, uh, in being fruitful in every good work, as Colossians 1.10 says. Colossians expounds the gospel of Christ, it tells us what Christ has done for us, what God has given to us in Christ, and it exhorts us to a corresponding lifestyle. There's a certain way we ought to live in light of the gospel of God's grace in Christ. But what does that actually look like? What is, how do you translate that into your daily life? Well, God has provided in the book of Philemon, he's provided just one little snapshot, one little slice out of the lives of three Christians 
Onesimus, Philemon, and Paul, who are being transformed by that gospel. And so we get a concrete example of what it's going to look like when the gospel changes life. I have a four-part outline. The first three verses are the opening greetings and grace. Then the largest section, verses 4 through 16, is the foundation for Paul's request. Finally, in verses 17 through 22, Paul actually makes his request. And then the last three verses are the closing greetings and grace. And just briefly, I'm going to hop back over to Zoom and make sure I'm not missing any chat or anything. Okay, good. No, no one sent me a, an urgent hair on fire chat message telling me that it's not working. So I'm going to proceed. We're going to go to the text of Philemon. Let's see. Today's Sunday School lesson is brought to you by the Berean Study Bible. Uh, just because I liked the way it translated verse 6. We'll, we'll explain more in a minute. I'm going to zoom in some more. There we go. Hope that's ooh, nice. Hope that's big enough. Section one, opening greetings and grace. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets at your house. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This you right here, the grace and peace to you in verse three. This is, uh, you can't tell in English because we have the same you, whether you talk to one person or multiple people, singular and plural are the same. In Greek, it's the plural. And that's noteworthy because uh, grace and peace to you, to all you, Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and the church that I just mentioned in the opening. That's what we would expect. We want it to be plural. That makes sense. But then the plural disappears from this point on. And the bulk of the letter, all the U's that you see from verses 4 through, 20, 4 through 21, those are all singular U's. There's not another plural U until you get to verse 22. So the plurals are really just the very first verses and the very last verses. The meat of the letter is all addressed to a singular U, just to Philemon. This is really a very personal conversation just between Paul and Philemon. Now we go to that conversation. Part two, Paul lays a foundation for the request that he's going to make without actually stating the request yet. He's going to, he's going to try to soften Philemon's heart before he puts the request out there. I always thank my God, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that your partnership in the faith may become effective as you fully acknowledge every good thing that is ours in Christ. I take great joy and encouragement in your love because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. So straight off the bat, Paul sets a tone of affection and camaraderie. He's not going to be talking down to Philemon or giving orders. Paul, Paul dignifies Philemon and also the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in Philemon. Paul sees the evidence of it, and he praises that. And Paul, Paul does not need to kindle in Philemon a Christian love that isn't already there. Paul sees that the love is already there because Philemon is transformed by the Spirit and indwelt by the Spirit, and Paul is seeing that come out in his actions. So Paul doesn't need to drum up a love that isn't there yet. Paul just needs to take hold of the love that he already knows is there and direct it toward Onesimus. Verse six is interesting. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen here from the Berean study Bible is probably not, probably not like what's in your Bible. Uh, the commentary that I read by William Hendrickson pointed out that verse 6 is a really difficult verse to translate because there are several different words in it that can have two or three legitimate meanings. And if you have a verse where there's just one word with a lot of different meanings, you can usually figure out the right one from context from the rest of the words in the verse. 
But if there are many different words in the verse that have multiple meanings, then it gets a lot trickier. There are a lot of, a lot of ways. How, is, how would you understand this? Oh no, okay. Thank you for the chat note. I've just been informed we're not seeing the text on screen, just the outline. Let me, let me make sure, okay. New share, we're gonna new share document two. Thank you, Jeff. How about now? Good, okay. I'm gonna proceed hoping that everybody sees the text of Philemon, the word of God right on your own computer screen. Verse six, I'm gonna highlight that. Verse six, notoriously difficult to translate and most of the major translations that we use on a daily basis say something like, Pray that your partnership in the faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us in Christ. It would say every good thing that is in us. So I read that in my ESV as I was trying to prepare for this lesson. Every good thing that is in us. Okay, so maybe he's talking about the gifts that the spirit gives to Christians. Maybe he's talking about the new nature born of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the point is that Paul would like Philemon to live out the gospel and make it clear to everyone else what is born in a Christian by the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's what it means. But after reading uh, William Hendrickson's commentary, I've, I've come around to his point of view, which is it's not every good thing that is in us for Christ, it's every good thing that belongs to us in Christ, every good thing that is ours in Christ. And it's not for the knowledge of them, for other people's knowledge, that other people would know them, it's, it's actually as you, Philemon, you understand, you're aware of every good thing that belongs to you, belongs to us in Christ. I pray that your partnership in the faith may become effective. Effective is energes, like energy. It may become active. It may do work in the world. It may become productive. As you, Philemon, fully acknowledge every good thing that is ours in Christ. Faith produces works according to the measure of our awareness of the kindnesses that God has lavished on us in Christ. And this becomes sort of the motor for the whole rest of this letter, and really for all of Philemon's Christian life, every good thing he ought to do as a Christian, every difficult thing he's going to do in life, he's going to be propelled through it by the full knowledge of every good thing that belongs to him in Christ. And then Paul takes great joy and encouragement in Philemon's love. It's not Philemon's love to Paul. They're in different cities, in different countries, far apart. It's Philemon's love toward the other saints. But Paul is so identified with those other Christians that just to hear about the wonderful things that Philemon does for them refreshes Paul's heart as much as it refreshes those saints. So we continue, verse eight and nine. So although in Christ I am bold enough to order you to do what is proper, I prefer to appeal on the basis of love for I, Paul, am now aged and a prisoner of Christ Jesus as well. So again, Paul does not talk down to Philemon. He talks to Philemon eye to eye. He's like a comrade in ministry. And this, this kind of voluntary laying aside of Paul's authority over Philemon, he is an apostle of Christ. He could order him what to do, but he voluntarily lays aside the authority and gets down and looks Philemon in the eye and appeals to him as a brother in love. He's doing to Philemon exactly the thing that he wants Philemon to do to Onesimus. That's how he wants Philemon to relate to the returning slave. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus. Paul mentions Onesimus 
for the first time in the letter, whose father I became while I was in chains. This is a reference to Onesimus' conversion under Paul's ministry. Paul's become his spiritual father by preaching the gospel that has brought Onesimus to life. Formerly, he was useless to you. This is, this is a play on words. The name Onesimus means beneficial or useful. And now Paul is going to make a sort of pun on his name. He was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Now that he is a changed man in Christ, he is finally living up to his name. And I am sending back to you him who is my very heart. So in this paragraph, Paul vouches for Onesimus' transformation in Christ. He was useless, but now he's useful because of the work of God in him. And Paul also identifies himself with Onesimus. He says, my child, my very heart. At this point, if Philemon loves Paul and knows that Paul loves Onesimus, it should be really hard for Philemon to be harsh toward Onesimus. And Paul continues, I would have liked to keep him with me so that on your behalf, he could minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that your goodness will not be out of compulsion, but by your own free will. And at this point, it's, it's, uh, it's necessary to make a decision about what tone you think Paul is writing this letter in. This, uh, this letter is almost funny the first time you read it. The way that Paul lays the pressure on Philemon, he never just comes right out and orders him what to do, but it, it's almost like he's, he's, uh, have you ever heard the expression, the, the iron fist in the velvet glove? It's uh, Paul's, Paul won't be directly assertive or aggressive or just tell Philemon, you must do this because I say so. But he lays out exactly what he wants indirectly and makes it so obvious Philemon can't possibly miss it. Is it flattery? Is it, is it a, a blend of flattery and intimidation? You have statements like, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that your goodness will not be out of compulsion, but by your own free will. I'm telling you indirectly exactly what you need to do, but I won't tell you you have to do it because I know what a good guy you are and, and you do want to be a good boy, don't you? You, you certainly don't want to disappoint old Paul. Or later on in the letter, verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. That is, I will repay Onesimus' debt to you, Philemon. Not to mention that you owe me your very self as well. There are a lot of statements like this throughout the book, and it actually, coming to it with our kind of, our jaded mind from, well, from our life in the world as we interact with other people and we see how people treat each other and the tactics of persuasion that we, well, honestly, that we all use with each other. Uh, we read that into Paul here. And it makes it funny, but it also makes it fleshly. If that's what Paul is doing, if Paul is leaning on a combination of flattering Philemon's pride and pressuring Philemon's fear of man, then really Paul is appealing to Philemon's old nature. And he could do that just as well to a non-Christian. There's nothing Christian or Christ-like about that. So I think it's important that we make a decision about what kind of tone we're going to attribute to Paul here. How do we think Paul is meaning the words he's saying? Does he have, does he have hidden meanings or, or ulterior motives, or is he just perfectly frank? And I think it's important to read Paul as perfectly transparent and earnest. He means exactly what he says and no more. He's not appealing to Philemon's old nature. He's appealing to Philemon's new nature, to stir up Philemon's love in Christ. So when he says in verse 14, I did not want to do anything without your consent so that your goodness will not be out of compulsion, but by your own free will, he means exactly what he says. He doesn't mean more than that. It really is his goal, not just to get Philemon to do what he wants Philemon to do, but to actually 
stir up Philemon's love, make Philemon understand what is the thing that pleases Christ, and then see Philemon obey Christ because of love, not because of flattery or intimidation. And in doing that, in doing that, Paul elevates Philemon from the level of a slave to the level of a family member. If Philemon were to obey and do the right thing, but out of compulsion, not having a choice in the matter, uh, what's referred to here is Onesimus had run away to Rome and met Paul there and become a Christian. And Paul said, oh, I kind of wanted to just keep Onesimus with me and say, this is Philemon's gift to the gospel work. This is Philemon's contribution since Philemon lives in Colossae and can't come out here to Rome. But now Philemon's slave is here. So I'm just going to say Onesimus is Philemon's contribution to gospel work. I wanted to do that, but if I had done that, your contribution would have been forced. It would have been against your will. You would have been doing the right thing, supporting the gospel, but not by your own free choice or understanding. And that is how a slave obeys. A slave doesn't need to know why. A slave just needs to do the right thing. But Paul doesn't want that. He wants Philemon's obedience from his own free will. Paul wants Philemon to know why this is right and to approve it because it's right, not just because it's what the authorities told me to do. And that is the obedience of a child of God and not just of a slave of God. A child is supposed to have the mind of God and understand why it's right. So Paul elevates Philemon from a slave to a child of God. And that's really the same thing that Paul is trying to get Philemon to do to Onesimus. Philemon needs to turn around and elevate Onesimus from a slave to a family member. Verse 15 and 16, for perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a beloved brother. He is especially beloved to me, but even more so to you, both in person and in the Lord. And <laughs> Paul seems a little optimistic here for perhaps this is why he was separated from you. And we could say, well, no, actually, Paul, I, I don't know if you're paying attention, but the reason Onesimus was separated is because Onesimus broke the law and ran away illegally. And he probably also took Philemon's money with him in order to fund his journey to Rome. That's why Onesimus was separated. But Paul, Paul's not out of touch with reality. Paul is seeing past this and seeing the reality of God's hand at work behind this, bringing this about. Yes, Onesimus did break the law and run away. Onesimus probably did steal as well. But God's overruling sovereignty turned it, even ordained it, in order to bring Onesimus in contact with Paul to hear the gospel and know Christ. So Onesimus meant it for evil, but God's overruling sovereignty meant it for good. Paul, Paul wrote, pull some really, really big ideas into this very small example of practical Christian living. In verse six, every good thing that is ours in Christ, Paul takes all the riches of Christ that he has laid out in the book of Colossians, which Philemon probably would have just read at the same time, being delivered by Tychicus together with the letter to Philemon. He takes all the riches of Christ that are ours in him. And he says, Philemon, I need to call these to your attention. I need to lift these up in your mind. I need to make sure you have all the riches of Christ and the fact that they belong to you. Have that in view as you consider this question of what to do with Onesimus. And then in verse 15, this is why he was separated from you for a while. Can't you see the hand of God at work in this? Paul pulls in the sovereignty of God that is able to work in spite of and actually even work through the evil of man to bring about God's redemption in Christ, the redemption of sinners who don't deserve it. Paul pulls huge ideas into this, and uh, that's exactly what we need to do. We, we need to pull very big truths into our small little Christian lives in order to walk with Christ. Maybe we can say that that is the art of Christian living is to know how to bring very big truths into 
very small little lives. At this point, we're halfway through the outline. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to unmute. Well, you know what? No, I won't unmute all of you, but I will give everyone the option to unmute themselves. You're now able to unmute yourselves and make comments or ask questions if you wish. Hey, Ben, um, I have a, a question about that verse 15, um, at least in, in my translation, it says, perhaps, perhaps this is the reason. And it's interesting to see in scripture and to see from an apostle who's writing inspired scripture, a, a perhaps. Uh, we, don't, we don't find that a lot in scripture. I'm, I, I'm reminded of Esther, uh, where Mordecai says, you know, how, who knows, maybe you've come to this time for, for exactly this reason. It's a hypothesis. Um, but we don't see the name God anywhere in Esther. It's kind of, it's, it's a little bit interesting in that, in that way. Here you have an apostle writing in the New Testament. He says, you know, you got to wonder whether, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way it reads to me. How do you read that verse and uh, Paul's willingness to hypothesize, I guess? Well, with all the knowledge of Greek and uh, hermeneutics and exegesis that I have, which uh, couldn't fill a thimble, I think just uh, I think it's it's Paul reasoning from Philemon's starting point. I think. Paul knows what's going on. I, I don't think there's any question in his mind, but Paul gets down and stands where Philemon is and looks at it from Philemon's point of view and says, can't you see, even if you're not an inspired apostle, even if you don't have the Holy Spirit writing scripture through you, even you, Philemon, you should be able to look at this and perceive perhaps, maybe this is the work of God. This is, uh, Paul is leading Philemon along the, the kind of path of logic that Philemon ought to be following. I, I, yeah, I, does, that, does that make sense? Does that, I don't... It does, but then I guess I would follow that with another question, which is, it feels to me like in our Christian walk, we approach these things not so much from Paul's uh, apostolic inspiration writing scripture but from Philemon's viewpoint right that's the viewpoint so is it appropriate for us in our Christian lives to be hypothesizing like that to be wondering about those things and thinking I wonder if God put me in this situation for x or I wonder if what God is doing here is y and how does that then shape my my response is that the sort of thought process we should be going through as Christians I think, I think what makes it okay for Philemon to do this is uh, the conclusion he's being led to is not, not one of those kind of like trying to use the Bible for fortune telling conclusions like, uh, uh, should I, should I quit this job or you know, quit this job and take another or stay in this company? I'd better just kind of open the Bible and let it fall open and see if I can find wisdom on the page it opens to. The conclusion that Paul is leading Philemon to see is part of the revealed moral will of God that, uh, you know, Philemon look, is very clear that Onesimus is in Christ now. He's your brother in Christ. I'll vouch for him. Paul does that in some of these verses. And the, the revealed will of God, the right thing to do in all circumstances is to accept such a one and to love this brother in Christ, to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Paul just wrote that to all the Christians in the Colossian church in the letter to Colossae. And so it's, Paul's not inviting Philemon 
to try to discern the future, it's, uh, it's about applying the revealed will of God and saying, hey, this is, this is one of those situations that that commandment applies to. Thank you. Hey, Ben. Yes. You know, I'm glad Matthew brought that up because I didn't even catch that, but I, I identify with it in my own application now as I'm saying, what is God doing with us in the middle of this whole coronavirus thing? And I, and I, I kind of caution myself and I have been cautioned that we don't know the mind of the Lord that we trust in him, we rest in him, and we certainly know what he's doing in us individually. We can focus on that. We don't know what he's doing in his church, and maybe we don't know what he's doing in the world. So sometimes we say in these conversations, and people that I read will say, perhaps, knowing that God is sovereign, but not knowing exactly the detail of it. So the perhaps that isn't uh, diminishing is God's sovereignty, but in terms of our truly knowing as we trust in this. But even with that said, it seems to be pretty clear what the Lord has done in, uh, in, uh, in Onesimus's life and then that God used it for good, you know, but just my comments in terms of the way I struggle now with in terms of understanding this providence of God of what's going on now. No, that's good. Thank you, Jeff. That's uh, actually the current pandemic Thanks for bringing that up. That kind of gives me an opportunity to clarify my own thought. That's uh, as we're living through this situation, we'll encounter, we'll have questions. Uh, maybe we could have a question like, should I, should I continue? Uh, well, again, should I continue? working where I've been working, even though maybe they're reducing my hours and laying me off. Maybe now's the time to go start that entrepreneurial adventure I've always thought about. Maybe this is God moving me toward that. Uh, that's, that's not something I think you can read from the circumstances. But on the other hand, maybe we'll have situations where uh, people are sick and in the hospital and we ought to go, well, I, I was about to say we have to go visit them as the scripture commands, but with wisdom, not uh, not exposing ourselves to contagion and exposing other people. But uh, there will be situations we encounter where it's a matter of showing the kind of mercy to people that scripture says. And then it's then we can say, ah, perhaps God has ordained all these events and brought this about to lead me into a situation where I ought to walk in this way, obeying the commands he's given me in scripture. And then that's different from wondering whether God has brought this about to push me toward a new entrepreneurial adventure or some other question that's not a matter of the commands of scripture and what it means to walk with God. And even as I say that, I, I see holes in what I'm saying. So I'm going to, we're going to stop this discussion and go back to scripture because I haven't thought through this yet. So treading on dangerous ground. Well, thanks everybody. I'm going to mute you all again. And we're going to go back to the text. All right, third section, Paul actually makes his request. And by this point, you know, Paul's gotten this far in the letter without actually telling Philemon quite what it is that he wants him to do for Onesimus. But Philemon sh should be able to guess by now. He should have kind of figured it out. However, more than just being able to guess where Paul is going with this, Philemon should even be beginning to want the same thing himself. Philemon should be beginning to soften and come around to the same point of view Paul has as Paul works on him with, well, with pretty inevitable reasoning about what it means to love Onesimus. If Philemon really is born of Christ's spirit and he really is controlled by Christ's love, then he should be starting to say, 
yeah, it's true. There is no good reason that my love for Christ's people can exclude Onesimus. I have to treat him the same way. And I want to treat him the same way. And yes, I do desire to show mercy. I do desire to reconcile this relationship. And so now, now Paul makes his request. Verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, receive him as you would receive me. Whoa, whoa, stop right there. I'm hearing echoes of something else in scripture. Where, where do you think you've heard that before? Do you, does, does that remind you of anything else in the Bible? And the answer is, yeah, that's the gospel of our salvation. That's what Christ has done for us. The son of God has said to God the father, receive these as you receive me. Impute my right standing with you and, and more than right, my, my favorable, my beloved, my delightful status in your eyes, impute that to these people. That's, that's an amazing thing for Paul to do. Where did, where did he learn to talk like that? Well, he learned it from his savior who did that for him. And now he's turning around and doing that for Onesimus. Verse 18, but if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, which he probably had, he'd probably stolen from Philemon in order to fund his journey, charge it to my account. Whoa, whoa, it just got even more explicit. Charge it to my account. That's, that's what Christ has done for Paul. The son of God has said to God the father, if these have wronged you in any way or they owe you anything, charge it to my account. And that's what we're celebrating this weekend. Two days ago on a Friday, Christ, the son of God, went to the cross and said, charge it to my account. And he died so that we will not ever, ever have to die under the wrath of God. And God raised him to life again, saying, it is finished. Receive him as you would receive me. Philemon, please impute to Onesimus my right standing with you and charge it to my account, whatever wrong he's done. Please impute to me Onesimus' wrong standing with you. Paul does a double imputation here. Paul's walk, Paul's Christian walk, at this moment in his relationship with Onesimus and Philemon, Paul's walk is taking the shape of the gospel. He is imitating his Savior. And he's also inviting Philemon to let his walk take that same gospel shape. Colossians 3.13, as Christ has forgiven you, so you also forgive one another. Philemon is going to get to play the role of Christ toward Onesimus and forgive Onesimus just as Christ has forgiven Philemon. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Whatever, Philem whatever Onesimus owes you, not to mention that you owe me your very self, referring to Paul's role in Philemon's salvation. Yes, brother, let me have some benefit from you in the Lord. And this word benefit is Onaimen, which sounds like Onesimus. They appear to be related words in Greek, so Paul's making another pun. Onesimus, his name means useful. And now Philemon, I would like you to be useful to me. I would like some benefit from you. Here's the benefit I want. Refresh my heart in Christ, which if you look back at verse seven, that's exactly what Paul has noticed that Philemon has been doing for all the saints in Colossae. You refresh their hearts and that refreshes my heart indirectly. And so now just as you do that in general toward all the saints you encounter, I'm asking you to do that now in this specific case of Onesimus, even though he's wronged you, even though he owes you, even though there's there's some offense to forgive. I ask you to refresh my heart by refreshing Onesimus. In fact, if you look back at verse 12, he actually calls Onesimus his heart. He says, I'm sending back to you my very heart. And so if we do, do a little math here, we can say my heart equals Onesimus. So refresh my heart equals refresh Onesimus. Paul makes his request very plain, but he does it in very warm very beautiful language. He, uh, he adorns this gospel request with the, the best language and the most persuasive language that he can come up with. And he continues, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. 
which, which again goes back to the tone of the letter. We have to make a decision about the tone. Is Paul, is Paul leaning on Philemon's pride and flattering him, saying, I, I know what a great guy you are. I know you'll do what I ask, and even more, because I know you want to impress me. Or is this just naked sincerity? Is this exactly what it looks like? Philemon, I know the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in you. I know your love for other Christians, and I know the decision that you're going to make about this in perfect earnestness. In the meantime, prepare a guest room for me because I hope that through your prayers, I will be restored to you. And Paul was released from his first imprisonment in Rome, as far as we can tell. I don't think it's made explicit in scripture, but uh, if church tradition is any guide, he was released and maybe he made it back to Colossae to see Philemon and Onesimus. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that is the entire book of Philemon. So again, I'm going to give everybody the opportunity to unmute if you want, just in case anybody has questions or comments. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Ben. You have just really opened up this book for me. I did read it ahead of time, thought about it, did the questions in the Sunday School book, and you have just made it so much richer for me. And um, so I thank you. I thank you. This was excellent. Thank you, Kristen. And uh, praise God. I, I had the same experience studying for it. I, I didn't know what this book meant before this Sunday school lesson, but uh, God's word is rich, including the parts that don't look like you wouldn't go to the book of Philemon to find the truth of the gospel explained in the highest possible terms like Colossians 1. What, what's it even there for? But it's been really good to study it and learn what it's there for. And I appreciate you uh, drawing out sort of that, uh, the imputation elements there, the the picture that that is of the gospel and uh, just on the chat here uh, the keepers say uh, that when you were talking about that part they said that sounds like second corinthians 5 21 right he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us and that whole charging to the account um, so it's just really um, i wanted to pass their comment along and then also to just say that for me seeing paul um rep replicates not the right word but it is in a sense a replication in the individual christian life of uh, the gospel truth, um, carrying that forward, you know, with tennis shoes on real, in a real practical way, saying that he's willing to accept, you know, on his account, whatever sins have been committed um, in sort of that practical, tangible, you know, I'll pay you back sort of way um, on Onesimus' account. Yeah, yeah, no, it's an exciting book. I, uh, I had a third document where I wrote up some observations or conclusions. I think rather than go through that now maybe we can post that on the website for people who want to read it and uh i think i'd love for everybody to have some time to just hang out and chat zoom has this nifty feature where i can break you all into smaller groups so you can have easier conversations than if the 20 of us tried to tried to talk all at once here i guess uh i will pray and thank god for our meeting today and then i'll start breaking you up into groups so here we go Father, I thank you in Christ's name that you have given us such a, a rich testimony of your rich grace in all our lives. I thank you for, I thank you for the, the gospel accounts of the life of your son. I thank you for the, the very high stirring doctrinal passages like in Romans and Colossians and elsewhere. And I thank you that you even give us portraits of the lives of your people from past times in whom your grace has made a complete transformation as examples for us to see and to know this is, this is your promise of what you're gonna do in us. You're gonna change us in these same ways. And we thank you for that and we look forward to walking that out for the rest of this life and then being with you for the rest of eternity. I thank you in Christ's name, amen.
Now, now, the breakout rooms. There are 19 of us, 16, 18. We're gonna go in groups of four-ish. No, we're gonna go in, yeah, yeah, groups of four, here we go. All right, creating rooms now. You should all get an invitation to a randomly assigned room. And you're welcome to join that room and enjoy fellowship. Ben, do you feel really powerful right now? I do, but also a lot of pressure. I don't want to get this wrong. It is being recorded, so it'll be immortalized forever. Do you want to turn the recording off before you send them out? In, uh, us oh, out yeah. Yeah, good call. Let me... By the way, I didn't turn on the recording on my side, so if you could figure out a way to get uh, me. Okay.